what a pleasant topic. But it becomes pleasant when you think about God's purposes in it and the end of it. Hi, Brent. Hi, Mrs. Brent. I, I wish I knew your first name. Will you tell me? Christy. Thanks. So God does not despise small things, and even if we have a class in small of number, it's not small in topic. So big topic, the entrance of sin into creation, it raises all kinds of questions, theological questions, what are the theological implications, and how do we sort through those things carefully so that we don't stray from the bounds of Scripture and we you know, uh, don't engage in reckless speculation. We try to keep our speculation um, bounded with known principles from Scripture. And it's a hermeneutical principle for us to take the more difficult things in Scripture, the less clear passages, and interpret them in light of the more clear passages. So things we know for certain we can extrapolate backward into some of these safe speculations, we'll call them. Before we begin the class, we'll test the clicker, and we'll begin with prayer. As I like to do, I would like to ask for a volunteer to pray, and then I'd like to pray also. Amen, Lord. I do pray you'd fill us with your spirit as we consider these things, even if we've considered them before. Help us to be refreshed in our remembrances of your truths, in your benevolent self-revelation to us. We acknowledge that your glory is our ultimate good. And we need to know you and for real, in person, not just in fact and in knowledge. So we ask that you'd impart to us a relational connection to you, a love for you that grows, an awe for you that grows, and an understanding that helps us to appreciate you more. We ask for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so for the purposes of this class, we've been asking that question that Jonathan Edwards asks in his great dissertation, The End for Which God Created the World. So we're asking, why is it that God chose to create anything outside of himself, what would have motivated him? And we're also asking, how has he chosen to glorify himself in the world? And so we've been focusing on the third major category of how God reveals himself in the created order, not just through the scripture rightly interpreted and through creation and the fingerprints of God all around us, but also in God's outworkings in angelic and human history. How is it that God is unfolding in His providence a history that reveals Himself? Edward's definition of providence is God's use of the world He has made. So we're looking at how is it that God is using history, intervening in history, interjecting in history. And we're, we're kind of framing the class on this 12 spiritual conditions of image-bearing creatures, three angelic and nine human, and this is our blank chart, and this is what the chart is going to look like full at the end. How is it that God uniquely glorifies himself in the spiritual conditions of elect angels, innocent angels, and fallen angels, humans in innocence, fallen humans, regenerate humans, glorified humanity? How is it that God uniquely glorifies himself in each of these spiritual conditions throughout history? God has allowed these conditions to exist, some of which exist temporarily, not that the record of that temporariness ever gets erased, but some of them are temporary. So last week we started with where God starts. He creates angels in a state of innocence in an angelic realm that he created specifically for them, perfectly suited for them and their capacities in, a, in, a, in what we would imagine, extrapolating backward from what we know about God in, in the created order that we live in, the realm that we're created to live in, that God has created wonderful and beautiful and diverse things in the angelic realm that they're designed to appreciate 
and all of which is designed to, to cause them to appreciate it in the person of God, in his creativity, in his provision, in his sustaining relationship to them as father. And they would have had a unique love in this state of innocence, in purity, a unique perspective on God, and God created them that way. But did God create angels in a state of innocence with the intention of leaving them there, you know, everlastingly? No, right? How do we know that? Because the fall came and things changed. So God didn't intend to leave them in that state perpetually. He intended that to be an initial state, to reveal himself in concentric waves in his, in his goodness. What he gives to his creatures is the very best thing he can give. That's himself in his own perfections. And so he's revealing to angels in the state of innocence aspects of himself that they can enjoy and appreciate, aspects of himself that aren't going to end there. They're going to be ripple waves that go out, more and more revelations, concentric waves of God's benevolent self-revelation that go out throughout angelic history. And so as we continue on in our discussion, Mike, you have a comment? Sure, go ahead. Before. Okay, there's some reasons that we would speculate that. There's not a, a timeline, a chronological timeline laid out in the Bible for us, like a systematic theology. So what we have to do is take clues and cues from the Scripture and speculate as accurately as we, we can and say this is the most probable timeline. You, you know, I like to think of things chronologically. But we think the fall of angels, the creation of angels, happened perhaps a long time before the creation of men. There are those who would say Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the world in six days, literal six days, and that the angelic realm was created simultaneously or concurrently with that. I would suggest there are other things in Scripture that would lead us to believe that's not the case. But Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of the material universe that we're inhabiting, the realm that he's made for us, this domain he's designed for us. And the reason, some of the reasons I would say that are by the time Satan gets to the Garden of Eden, he's already well-developed. There's a lot of things that have had to have transpired before that timeline comes into effect. So that's one of the reasons I would speculate that that happened. Now, granted, this is speculation, and so we're making the best guess we can by extrapolating backward from what's known to what's unknown. And we're asking about the mys mysteries of, of God's self-revelation. How might this have occurred? And we're making the best speculation we can, still recognizing that that's speculation. Okay, could it be right that it was created concurrently with the, the creation of the earth? Yes. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't mention that at all. So which direction will you speculate? We're going to speculate in the direction that we're led to by the other clues and cues that we see. So in my understanding, and this is just one guy, but there's lots of people who think like this, and I've been influenced by a lot of good people. The angelic realm probably existed for some kind of an eon of time. As we think of time, we think angels are probably like us, linear creatures experiencing reality as an unfolding succession of moments, not eternal like God, who exists outside of time, but they're experiencing God in time. And you think about the joy of discovery. If you're an angel created in innocence, and we think angels were created like Adam and Eve as mature beings. We don't think they were created like angel babies and they grew up. We don't believe that angels procreate. They're not given in marriage, Jesus says, and, you know, we'll be like them in heaven. So there's some distinctions Jesus is making in the Gospels about angels. So we're, we're presuming that they're non-procreative. They're created as mature beings like Adam and Eve, yet they're kind of a blank slate in some ways. They have the hardware and the software, but they don't yet have the data. And so as they experience God's kindness to them in their realm, throughout their experience of unfolding moments, they're discovering new things about God. And so their food, like Jesus says, my food is to do the will of the Father. Their food is to see what God is going to do next and to say, wow, look at all that God is showing us in this realm that he's created for us. And now he's showing us works in that realm. He's showing us elements of sustenance, elements of relation, elements that he's unfolding. And so there's this joy of discovery. Is it, there's a benefit to being a linear creature, right? You get the joy of surprise and discovery. Now, God doesn't need to be surprised or discover anything, but it's a gift that He gives to us. It's like humor. Sometimes the punchline for a good joke 
makes you laugh because it catches you by surprise. It's not the ending you expect. So the setup for the joke comes along and you expect it to go one way and it surprise twists, it goes another way and you, you chuckle because you didn't expect it. And so that's a gift from God to a linear creature. So it's, it's, it's remarkable to think that a limited creature, the, the very act, the very fact that we're limited means that limitation itself can incorporate a body of gifts that suits that limitation, the joy of discovery. I mean, even going through a Christian life and you discover God being faithful to you in trials and joys and you, you know, parents seeing the birth of their baby and seeing these things unfold, just the unfolding in a human life as a microcosm, what discovery there is in it. You know, it's learning, and I tried to say this last week, that all of life is designed as a school of theology. Everything in life is a picture of, of a greater reality. It's a type of a greater thing. And so parenthood, what is that going to teach us? It should teach us something about God's fatherhood, right? Being a student, being a worker. All the things that God gives us in life are designed ultimately to teach us something about Him. If Edwards is right, and, and the premise of this class is right, that God created all things outside of Himself for the benevolent revelation of His glory. Okay, if that major premise is true, every subordinate premise that we discover in life should fit that major premise, right? So everything in life is supposed to teach us something about God, and it will prove to be so in the end. Now, we're, we're dull a lot of times. I go through life, I, half the time I don't see all the good things God's doing for me because I'm just spiritually dull. And then sometimes later in life, God will give me this new retrospective, and I'll, I'll go, wow. You know, at the time, I didn't get that job. I was so disappointed. I didn't understand how God's providence was leading. I need to provide for my family. I thought it was a shoe in I was number two, and I came in. Number two is still the first place loser. I didn't get the job. So what's God doing? And then later on, you get this new retrospective, and you say, wow, I'm so glad God prevented me from getting that job. Because if I had gotten it, the thing I wanted so bad and was praying for so much, it would have disrupted this greater blessing that God brought, this unexpected blessing that I had no foreknowledge of, but God knew. And so now that it unfolds, I see, oh, why would I be disappointed when God says no? Right? So all of that is to say, just learning that God is always working for the good of those he loves, like Romans 8.28 says, is something for us to consider as we go through life. But yeah, with the angelic realm, back to your question, we believe there was probably a great deal of time for the development of this unique perspective on God and this unique relationship that God made with them so that when the temptation comes, the angels who are being subjected to temptation should know better. They have a history. They know their father. They know his love. They know his kindness, his goodness, his provisions. They know all kinds of things about him, and so the culpability is there. So they're not just blank slates, and it doesn't just happen like uh, boom, boom, boom. From what we know about God, he's patient. He takes us through trials. He teaches us things, and so he's teaching his creatures that he loves. These are his children, too. He creates angels' direct creation. Now, they're non-corporeal. They're not, they're not exactly like us in every way, but they're like us in the sense that they possess intellect and emotion and volition and moral capacity and abstract reasoning and all these communicable attributes of God so that they can know Him, right? So we know some things about angels, and if angels are that much like us and their design is the same as ours, to give glory to God and to know God and enjoy Him forever, then we can presume speculatively by extrapolating back with it, God must have been treating them with the same kind of kindness and love that He does us, right? That's a fair speculation, wouldn't you say? And that would have had to have occurred over the course of time. Mm -hmm. The usage of the name Satan becomes more prominent afterward. But if you look at the scriptural list of the names for Satan, it's a really pretty long list. And it's not a very nice list. You know, father of lies, you know, <laughs> slanderer, murderer, these kind of things. The list is long. And we can get into that a little bit later. But uh, in the beginning, he's created, like God creates everything, good. Okay? When he created in Genesis, and he declares everything good, except for one thing, it wasn't good that the man be alone, but then he fixed that. So then he declares it all good, and he rests from all his creation, and he enjoys his creation on the Sabbath. So he created angelic realm in good, too. We know God only creates good things. 
So we're going to get into some of this with this introduction of evil, the entrance of evil into creation. So the question we already started asking is not only why has God allowed corruption and sin to enter the created order, but how? And both of those questions are very important. Not only why did God create anything outside of himself, but how he reveals himself. And why and how has he allowed sin and corruption to exist in the created order? This becomes a difficult question theologically for a lot of people. It becomes so confusing, in fact, they, they run off into aberrant heresies like open theism. So the question that arises, even as soon as you ask this question, you have to say, is God the author of sin? He's ordained all things that come to pass. He's created everything outside of himself to glorify himself, everything. Is he the author of sin? You see, there's, there's that ancillary question that just pops up immediately, and so we have to answer that question. And some of the things we might say is, let's look at the Scripture first. I am the Lord, it says in Isaiah, and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. Now, this is the God of the Bible. Okay, the open theist wants to somehow get God off the hook for the, the existence of evil in the world and say, well, it caught him, you know, by surprise, and he has to remedy that and make a solution to that, and he has a plan B, and, you know, he didn't really mean for that to happen, but the free will, the free will, you know, undercut God's perfections, and now he's got to deal with it. They're trying to let God off the hook, but he doesn't want to be let off the hook. He says, I am the God who does all these things. I create light and darkness, well-being and calamity. I'm the Lord who does all these things. Now, that's kind of the what of what he does, but the how is very important. We can say that God in his omniscience and his foreknowledge planned all these things from eternity past, preordained them and predestined them to come to pass, but did he put his hand to temptation or evil? No. Okay? So right off the bat, I want to say one thing, and we're going to keep this right in the mind as we go through. You'll see some scriptures. God is not the guilty author of sin. Okay, what do we mean by that? He knows that sin is going to come into existence. He plans to allow it. And it's not just this passivity like he can't control it, like some dualistic battle. He knows it's going to come into existence, but he doesn't touch it. So then he's ordained the entrance of sin into creation through the use of secondary means. Because God is the prime cause in all that's caused, the prime mover in all that's moved, does not mean he doesn't utilize secondary causes and responsible moral agents in their actions he ordains that he will utilize those actions toward a greater end. But he doesn't himself tempt anyone. He can't be tempted. He doesn't tempt anyone else. But he does plan for these responsible moral agents to act outside of his morality so that he can do something greater. And we'll see that as we go. Another verse. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. It is his good pleasure to temporarily allow some of these things through the actions of secondary agents for a greater good that we'll also see. You can remember what God says to Pharaoh. He says, indeed, for this reason I've allowed you to remain. And you remember the context, Pharaoh, you know, oppressing the Israelites and doing evil and denying God and at every turn. He says, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name throughout all the earth. Remember, the whole earth is going to be filled with God's glory. And the whole earth is going to be filled with all of God's glory, not just part of it. Not just His goodness but his wrath against sin, his justice, his holiness, everything about God is going to be revealed in this context, this contrast between good and evil. You see, God in his omniscience understands the concept of evil before it comes into existence, but he's not going to perpetrate that himself, but he is going to display himself as a, in a contrast to that. 
he says to, to Pharaoh, I'm going to proclaim my name throughout all the earth, and still you exalt yourself. It's a satanic typology. In typology, we usually think of typology as like this Old Testament preview of something that's going to happen later, the fulfillment of the type. But typology can also be extrapolated backwards. And we're going to see that a couple of things. That's a very good observation, Mike. I appreciate that. This is a satanic typology. The Pharaoh who thinks he's the ruler of all, the big cheese in the world, he still exalts himself even in the face of this confrontation with God. He's insane with his delusional self magnification, this megalomania, megalomania, I can't say the word, megalomaniacal, I cannot say it. (laughs) Proverbs says, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who's proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord, assuredly he will not be unpunished. So God says right there, I've, de- I've created everything, even the allowance of evil to come into the created order, and yet it will not go unpunished. It will not escape my justice. James makes it clear, God can't be tempted. He doesn't tempt anyone. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. This is an echo of the satanic original sin too. Enticed by his own lust, then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. The wages of sin is death. And yet, look at the next verses. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God gives only good as far as his direct involvement goes, okay? So if you want to talk about sin, don't be blaming God for it. Don't be saying, who is God to judge me? How is it that he made me like this? Does not the potter have the right over the same clay to make one lump for you know, common use and one for noble use? God has the right because he has a greater thing in mind. Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice Righteous and upright is he. But for those who have acted corruptly toward him, they're not his children. It's a big statement. Because of their defect, their perverse and crooked generation. This is a self-induced defect. You have to remember that. God is not the guilty author of sin. He never put his hand to temptation. This is a self-induced defect. Okay, and that's what a lot of people don't get. Remember... Yes. Yes. How? Ancillary question. Okay. So if God intentionally hardens Pharaoh's heart and says, I, I've hardened your heart, there's also says in the Bible that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. It says both of those things. So how are both of those things simultaneously true? Let's try to answer that real quick. All God has to do to harden the heart of a sinner is withhold his restraint, which he owes no one, by the way. Does he owe any creature anything? What do you have that you've not received? Every good thing you've ever had, you have a gift from God. You didn't create it yourself. So if God is causing a restraint from evil in the world... Restraint from evil in the heart of Pharaoh, who wants to glorify himself in his megalomania, said it. So, Pharaoh wants to glorify himself, and God can restrain his madness, but does God owe him that restraint? He owes no creature anything. All God has to do to harden Pharaoh's heart is to relax his restraint and let Pharaoh harden his own heart. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a ripening for judgment prior to Christ's return that has begun in earnest. The world has gone collectively mad in many respects, and they're going mad at an ever-increasing rate. What's most alarming about it is the exponential rate of degeneration. We've always had degeneration, but any of us have lived on the planet any length of time know that the rate of degeneration is accelerating like an avalanche. The exponential rate of degeneration is absolutely alarming, but alarming in a good way for those who believe that the biblical prophecies of end times conditions are coming true right before our eyes, and that has to happen before the Lord can return. 
Okay, Jesus is coming, and that's proof. So yes, all God has to do for evil to flourish in the world is to withhold his restraining influence that he owes no one anyway, and they will do it to themselves. What we're witnessing right now is the world acting independently from God. A realm in a body of creatures inhabiting that realm who were designed specifically to depend on God, the God who gives all good things, all of His incommunicable attributes were designed to depend on them, His foreknowledge. We need to trust Him because only He knows the future. His provisions, only He has the, the cattle on a thousand hills, right? Ultimately, He's the one that has to give us a job and give us the capacity to do it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what we're seeing is a world that's saying, I don't need God. I can be independent from God. And look at us implode because we're acting independently from God. You've got 7.7 billion human beings on the planet all thinking that they're little gods, running around trying to assert their own little destinies. My free will is the determining factor in my destiny. I'll make my own way. Independence from God brings chaos, destruction, self-destruction, and ultimately hell. Right? So yeah, that's what we're seeing, a world acting independently from God. So that's kind of the outcome. You're getting ahead of us a little bit. You remember Joseph's story. His brothers threw him in a pit. They wanted to kill him. Reuben says, nah, let's not kill him. That's a little further than I want to go. Let's just sell him into slavery. Then I ease my conscience a little bit. They sell him into slavery. They think he's probably dead or, or gone, long gone, never see him again. And they come in this time of famine, and they're fearful because of what's going on. Now the revelation that Joseph is here. It's like Joseph is a type of Christ. Okay? And he is, he's, a, he's like a temporary localized savior of sorts. He stored up seven years of grain from all the agricultural lands of Egypt and stored them up in barns for the seven years of famine that, that he foresaw prophetically, right? So he comes, his brothers come to him, and they're deadly afraid. This guy's second in charge of the, 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 you know, the empire here, the, the Egypt, Egyptian empire. And now he's going to remember what we did to him. We despised our own siblings so much we were, we were just about ready to kill them. Well, we sold them instead. And then, now they stand before him like people standing before Christ in the judgment. And he says, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Only God can turn evil around into a greater good. No one else can do that. God alone possesses the sovereign power to override evil and turn it into a greater good. And that's what God is doing in this, this stage, this theater of display of God's glory right now. We know corruption only exists temporarily, but man, it exists for some pretty serious reasons. God is showing us things about Himself that will never be duplicated, never been seen before in history, never will be repeated. This portion of history is so unique in its display of who God is that we can't lose this. We can't lose sight of how how valuable this revelation of God is and how valuable that's going to be echoing through the ages of everlasting life. We'll never, ever forget how God has displayed Himself in this time period, in this realm right now. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. So we're back to our original question, the end for which God created the world, even the existence of evil. He created all that exists outside Himself, even evil, for the display of His marvelous perfections and acts of benevolent self-revelation toward image-bearing creatures so that all that exists will uniquely glorify Him and reveal components of His nature that couldn't be otherwise revealed. And this is the best way it could possibly unfold. You know why I know that? Because God only does things the very best way they could possibly be done. You can't say, well, what if He tried it this way? Or what if He tried it that way? No, no. This is the way God is doing it. This is the very best way it could possibly be done. So when sin enters the stage of creation, this subordinate conclusion should match our, our original conclusion. We said this is our major premise, so all the minor premises should fit this if it's true. So if He has allowed sin and corruption to exist in the created order, it's also for the same reason, so that all will uniquely glorify Him. We already quoted this. Okay, what if God, although willing to demonstrate His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Why? He did so to make known the riches of His glory upon vessels of mercy, which He prepared beforehand for glory. How would we even know mercy? 
He's patiently enduring his own enemies in the corrupt state, putrefied state, in his holiness. He's enduring this patiently for the greater good of those he loves in the giving of his own revelation. It's absolutely profound. If you grab onto God's purpose for the existence of the universe, it has to inform your purpose for existence too. So when we're going to get into the origin of sin a little bit, this question always arises. Pastor Earl and I were talking about this last week. So in the perfectly sinless environment of the angelic realm, in a being created in sinlessness, because God created everything, this is talking about Lucifer, how did internal temptation arise from within the heart of Lucifer? I don't know. R.C. Sproul says, I don't know. Every theologian who has any ounce of honesty says, I don't know. This is a mystery. This is Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. He did not cause it to happen directly. He allows it to happen through the independent, morally responsible actions of a secondary agent, Lucifer himself. And this is where the mystery lies. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to answer this question for you. No matter how many times you ask, how many ways you ask, I won't be able to answer this question. It's very similar to Adam, but not the same, because Adam is tempted externally. And so the real mysterious part of this question is, how does a creature in a sinless environment with no external temptation, the existence of evil has never come in, into play, right? There's no knowledge of good and evil. There's only good. And he's created good, but he's created peccably. That's just a Latinized theological term, which means he is capable of sin. We know this because he sinned. How did the internal temptation arise from within the heart of Lucifer? All we can speculate about is somehow, and we have references to this in the, in the New Testament. Pastor Earl mentioned in his sermon this morning, okay, when he talked about the qualifications of elders, not a novice, not a new convert, lest he become conceited and fall into the snare of the devil. You don't want to have a new convert as an elder. Why? Because he gets up here and he feels the side of this pulpit and he feels like he's spiritually influential and he feels like he's doing good and he's, you know, he's up there and he's a leader. That temptation applies to every single elder, whether he's a new convert or an old convert. But the new convert can't handle that temptation without the conceit attaching to him. You ever met a proud young pastor? A dangerous creature. Okay? So, we do get, this is what the Bible says, the conceit of the devil is the temptation you have to spare the young convert from. And by the way, maybe that's why we shouldn't be putting women up on the front lines of the spiritual battle. You know, men are supposed to be protectors as image bearers of God. There's a certain maleness to image bearing and a femaleness to image bearing. And what is the male? Part of his role is to be a pro provider and a protector. So we don't advocate putting women on the front lines of battle in wartime. Why? Are they, uh, because they're incapable? No. I know gals who can sling a gun like Annie Oakley, okay? doesn't mean they can't do it. It means we should be the ones stepping out in front and saying, I'll take the bullet because I don't want her to take it. I want to protect her. I want her to take care of my kids. I love her. And when you go off to battle, you don't send your women. It's not manly. It's not image-bearing. We don't put women up here in the front of spiritual battle and say, go ahead, sweetie, I know you're a great theologian and you're very eloquent of speech. Go ahead and be the spiritual leader and subject yourself to the temptation of conceit that sucked the devil down into hell. You don't put the woman on front line. It's wrong. It's bad enough okay, for us to pray and say, God, humble me because I think I had a good sermon today. What do I have that I've not received? Okay. The temptation to conceit is, what, is, is the temptation that's described of the devil, his beauty. And so all we've learned in the Scripture about Lucifer is that he was one of the highest angels. We know angels have a hierarchical structure. They have different order. There's order. Everything God creates is created with order. He's a God of order, right? So if he's one of the highest angels, presumably the highest angel, maybe uh, ministers to God in a very unique way and has a... Has a, has a beautiful appearance and a beautiful way about him. All we know is he became so enamored with himself that he chose to try to take the place of God and accept worship. And you know, we're not to worship angels, right? 
He is an angel who wanted to be worshipped. So this self-mutation that arose within him was born of pride and conceit. We know that much. But how it happened, from, we don't know. Like I said, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Only the things revealed belong to us and to our sons that we might observe them forever. God has the right to keep things secret from us because we don't have the capacity to understand everything at this point. We'll never have the capacity to fully comprehend God. If he could be comprehended by a finite mind, he'd be lesser than the finite mind. God will always transcend our, our capacity to understand. Even in heaven, when our understanding grows and our capacities grow and we understand God more and more and more, we'll never, ever be able to catch up to the infinitudes of God. We'll never, ever fail to be surprised by His perpetual, endless revelations of His own infinities to us. You see the benefit of being a limited creature? So, yes, the nature of the temptation is pride, it's conceit, it's self-love. We don't know much more than that, but it arose within his heart and he self-mutated. And so, from that point forward, we know a little bit more. How did Lucifer's self-deifying, self-deifying pride, he wants to be like God, how did it mutate his soul from that mysterious point onward? And we definitely have some revelation about that. God immediately judges Satan. He says, for my own sake I will act, for how can my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. He's not going to share his glory with Lucifer because that would be wrong. Lucifer is not the eternal one. He's not the self-existent one who eternally exists in three persons and all his perfections. There can only be one God, the necessary cause of all that exists. He will not give his glory to another because it would be a perversion. So I want to say this about Satan, and we're going to extrapolate backwards a little bit. We're going to think about the false prophets. They arise among the people in the church, just as there'll be false teachers who secretly introduce destructive heresies. Let's think about the nature of a false prophet and think about Satan as the original false prophet. He's in heaven He's now promoting himself as God. He's actually enticing other innocent angels to come and worship him and follow him instead of God. The word antichrist, that prefix anti, doesn't mean against, it means before. It means here's Christ and here's Lucifer saying, I'm before him. Look at me. I'm occluding him. You can't see him anymore. You see me. Antichrist, before Christ. I'm here blocking your vision of him. And you look at me. You see the nature, just in the name Antichrist, or the nature of this self-deification, this, this taking the place of God. And the false prophets, they secretly introduce destructive heresies, denying the master who bought them. They, of course, bring swift destruction upon themselves. But what happens in the meantime, they tempt people. Many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed for self-attention, they'll exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So this is kind of a picture after the fact, kind of an anachronistic typology, if you will. And you take that retrospective back and say, this tells us something about the nature of Satan's sin. He's enticing the entire realm of innocent angels to follow him instead of God. So this is temporary, and I want to just emphasize this point. The temporary necessity of the existence of evil is for the display of God's perfections. Why? So that all that exists will eternally glorify God. The temporary nature of the existence of evil is a very important concept to consider. God allows it to exist temporarily for an eternal good, an everlasting good that never ends. We think about that in, in Romans. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's to be revealed to us. The sufferings of this present time are temporary. The anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. There's something greater coming. There's there's this teleological end to it. When you take a telescope and say, what is the end of all this going to be? A greater end. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. That's God subjecting creation to futility temporarily in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
We know the whole creation groans and suffers this temporary pains of childbirth. And that's what God is describing here. Okay? Through Paul, the existence of evil are pains of childbirth that come before the birth of the child. And those pains will be forgotten, but the child won't be. Okay? The sufferings are of this present time. They're temporary. Let's go into a definition of sin. This is a classical definition of sin taken from the Westminster Confession of Faith, question 14. Shorter confession says, what is sin? Sin is any lack of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. That's a pretty concise definition. So it's not only committing evil acts, it's failing to do good acts. It's both, two sides to that coin. There's that whole passive sinning where you don't do the right thing, and they use these proof texts. If you practice sin, you practice lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. It's defiance of God's law, saying, he says he's the lawmaker, I'm going to make my own rules. I'm my lawmaker. That's defiance. Next thing, to him who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Commission of sin, omission of good, both things are sin. And all have sinned, this is a universal norm, and falls short of the glory of God, which would be obedience. Conformity to His truth, right? Here's another definition of sin that I love. It's so concise, and it speaks to the motivation. Not just what it is, but why it is. Sin is cosmic treason. On a cosmic scale. Here's one that's less concise. This is the one I tried to work up. And instead of calling it a definition of sin, I'm calling it the nature of sin because it's a little verbose. But let's look at this. What is the nature of sin? Okay, it's not just acts and failures to act. There's a motivational complex behind it. And God is a God who's concerned with the heart. So sin is a willful, rebellious, treacherous betrayal by a subordinate creature who acts in defiant opposition toward the supreme creator. You think about those adjectives I tried to stack up. I, I, you know, there were more I wanted to put in there. It's willful, deliberate, it's rebellious, it's defiant, it's treacherous, it's an absolute betrayal, biting the hand that feeds. If you had a dog that bit you after you fed him his whole life, you'd probably be disappointed with his loyalty. It's a betrayal of the good God by a subordinate creature. How does sin manifest? It displays a disbelieving disloyalty, intentionally disbelieving, not just unbelief like, I don't get it, I don't quite know if I believe that yet. No, it's disbelieving. I know the truth, I choose not to believe it disbelieving disloyalty toward God and His benevolent self-revelation. It's a personal act against the goodwill and perfect person of God. It is very personal. Sin is always, in the Scripture, related to an individual. It's not separate. You know the old evangelical sin? Well, God hates the sin, but He loves the sinner. Well, that preaches well. But theologically, it doesn't really match the Scripture that well. Because every time you see sin mentioned in Scripture, it's applied to an individual or a group of individuals sinning together. Okay? You don't have the capacity to separate the sin from the sinner. Sin is committed by a sinner personally toward God. It's always toward God. Against thee and thee alone have I sinned, O Lord. Remember David crying out in confession in the Psalms? Sin originates in the corrupted soul of a pridefully self-mutating image bearer of God, whether angelic or human. Self-mutation comes from the pride of saying, I'll be in the place of God. I'll determine what I'm going to do. He says his will is this, but I say my will is that. What are you doing right there? I'm elevating myself to the position of God. I'll determine. I decide. I choose. Who are you to tell me what to do? Self-mutating pride. Every sin can be traced to its root in self-deifying pride. If I had to do a concise definition like Sproul did, where he says sin is cosmic treason, I would say sin is self-deifying pride toward God. So you can't, uh, you can't say a sin is sin because the devil made me do it. That is correct. You cannot say the devil made me do it. You can say the devil was the origination point of sin, but I have been corrupted and I sin. Why do I respond to temptation unless I'm corrupt in my soul. Sin is not an act of the mind. It's not an act of the will. Those things are all involved. Sin is soulish. It comes from the soul, the corrupted soul. 
Why would I respond to temptation if I wasn't already corrupt? Why would I like that stuff? Why do I watch stuff on TV that I would never watch if the Lord Jesus was sitting next to me? Because I know he wouldn't like it. Why do I like it? Watching all these homicide shows. Boom, 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 blood and guts. Why do I watch that? Well, I'm not a murderer. I just like watching it on TV. What is wrong with me? I'm corrupted. No, he, Correct. Right. Yep. If you fail at one point, you're guilty of all. And so really what you have to understand, even in the Westminster Confession, when they're talking about the law, they're not necessarily talking just about the theocratic Mosaic law in the theocratic nation of Israel, the 1600, uh, 613 laws okay, and statutes. They're really talking about the law of God. If you look in the whole corpus of Scripture in the New Testament, the law of God is going to be written on our hearts in the New Covenant. The law of God is really obedience to God in everything. It goes beyond those 613 commandments. You're complaining that that would be impossible to do. I agree. Nobody has done that except Jesus. Okay. So one thing the law does is it teaches us our need of Christ. It's a schoolmaster to lead us to, to the, the true lawkeeper. But um, the real true law of God is be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That goes way beyond the Levitical law. That frustrates me way more than you're describing the frustration with these, the, the, you know, who could, who could obey that? Uh, who could be perfect? Like God is the Lord Jesus. There's only one. And so, yeah, you're right. And I think the Westminster is using law in a more general sense in that case. And so I didn't deliberately omit that from my attempt at a definition here. I think it's implicit in what I'm saying. This disloyalty and defiance toward God and His benevolent self-role is, is defying any truth that God teaches us about his, his, Himself. If we're image bearers of God, we're called to be like Him in every way. Right? That goes beyond any, any written law. It goes beyond a moral code. It goes to the heart and the motive of the heart and the union of the heart to God and independence on Him. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, abide in me. If you don't abide in the vine, what happens? You wither and die. Exactly. So uh, obedience to the law of God is, is, is integrally connected to our, our communion and union with Him and our dependence on Him as our provider and sustainer. We're not designed to be independent creatures at all. The beautiful thing about being a dependent creature is you can depend on the one you're, you know, you're, you're called to trust in. He's dependable. And so I, I'm not afraid to say I want to depend on God. You know, I'm a rugged individualist. I'm from the Western U.S., and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it on my own, and I'm not going to depend on anybody. I'm not going to call my papa and say, I need a little cash. I'm doing, no, I'm going to be self-sufficient. No, when it comes to me, I would depend on God for everything. I was designed to depend on God for everything, and that's a beautiful thing. Of course. Of course. They even said as much. You know? Absolutely. But you want to talk about freedom. Now, we're going to take a preview forward into our temporary state, into our permanent state. We will have the nature and the freedom to obey. Every single motion of your heart in heaven will be to please God. And you'll be so pleased to do it that you'll be so free that you'll always be doing everything you want to do all the time. Wouldn't you like that right now? Well, I get to do everything. You know, some guy gets rich and hits the lottery and thinks, I can do whatever I want all the time now. whoop de doo Now life is grand for me. Now that's, that's folly. When your heart is so purified and transformed, you, you talk about the new birth being a transformation. 
when we die, that's going to be the biggest transformation. We're going to be complete, all sin is going to be completely eradicated from us. Every motion of our heart and our desire is going to be to please God all the time. And we're always going to do everything we want to do all the time because it's going to be exactly what God wants to. We're going to concur with his, the beautiful purity of his will and, and love the things he loves and hate the things he hates and abide in that holy state in such a sense of freedom. There's no conceivable freedom like that. Okay, I want to go on a little bit. I want to look some more at typology and in the, in the human realm that we can extrapolate backward a little bit toward understanding the nature of the satanic temptation. And, I, and, and I, the Lord brought this to mind this week. Absalom's betrayal of King David, who is a type of Christ, by the way. You think about this, the description of Absalom in 2 Samuel. Now, in all Israel, no one was as handsome as Absalom. So highly praised, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no defect in him. He was the most handsome man anybody had ever seen. He was just a beautiful prince and a privileged prince. So think of the parallels between his story and Satan's story in heaven. Absalom used to rise early. He got it in his heart that he wanted to be king. He went to the gate, and when men came and they wanted to bring a suit to the king seeking justice, Absalom would call out, and then he would say, you know, where are you from? Absalom would say, see, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Moreover, he would say, oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has any suit or course or cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. I would give him justice. You're not going to get justice from the king. He's too busy. You're never going to reach him. He's so unapproachable. But here I am at the gate meeting you, and if you wanted me to be your king, I would give you justice. I'll give you justice. You see, he's trying to step in front and say, don't go to the king. I'm right here. Right? The people should have known better, like the innocent angels should have known better. So when a man came near to prostrate himself before Absalom, he put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him and lift him up. And this manner Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment, and Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. He tried to steal their loyalty from the king, didn't he? Just like Satan did to the innocent angels in heaven. David, the king, says to Absalom, go in peace. The king is speaking peace to Absalom, doing him good. What does Absalom do? He sends spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king in Hebron. He's plotting this mutiny against a good king, right? And the conspiracy was strong for the people increased continually with Absalom. He's winning them over. Big crowds of, of the population are coming to him, just like a third of the angels are coming to Satan instead of God. And even David hears of it, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. And so this betrayal is widespread. What does Absalom do next? pitches a tent on the roof of his father's residence and defiles it. In the sight of everyone, sets himself up. I'm the king. I have the concubines. That's a whole other layer of the story that goes beyond the purposes of the class. But yes, there's consequences there. There are layers to this story. But for right now, I'm just focusing on, on Absalom's betrayal as a satanic typology that we can export backward and extrapolate and to try to understand the nature of this betrayal in heaven. Absalom in his lifetime had taken up and set himself a pillar in the king's valley and he named the pillar after his own name. This tells you something about the man's heart. He's a self-glorifying, self-elevating, megalomaniacal, self-kingmaker. And you know, th that monument... I'm going to build a monument and I'm going to name it after myself and stop here and don't even bother going to the king. It tells you something about his heart. What is the end of Absalom? Very similar. Okay, he gets his head caught in a tree while he's trying to destroy the king. And the servant of the king drives three spears through his chest. And all those that were working with Joab also gathered around and cheered his demise like we will at the end of the age when God casts Satan into hell. We will concur with that judgment. He's the one that frustrated the world with evil and brought this corruption on us, and we will concur with God's judgment. They took Absalom, cast him into a deep pit in the forest, and erected over him a great heap of stones so that no one would forget. 
and all Israel that was with Absalom, they all fled like cockroaches. Let the rocks cover me. There will be no escape from the justice. So you see how we can use biblical interpretation to extrapolate a safe speculation backward toward what we don't know fully. Okay. Also, satanic typology in Isaiah. This is a rebuke from God through the prophet Isaiah to the king of Assyria. It's often used as a picture of Satan's fall. Look at this, how, how applicable this is to Satan. As it is with many Old Testament prophecies, there are dual purposes for the prophecy. There's an immediate context in a human realm, but there are ramifications in the heavenly realm that echo through. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth. You have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And yet you see God's justice. Nevertheless, you'll be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Look at these statements underlined. I will, I will, I will, I will. Compare that to Jesus. I've come to do thy will, O Lord. Thy will be done on heaven as it is on earth. You see a contrast in that? Another satanic typology in Ezekiel. God speaks through the prophet Ezekiel to the king of Babylon. He says, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. How is this not referring to Satan? I don't know, because the king of Babylon wasn't in Eden. The garden of God, every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. God gave him a position of great privilege. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. And then it goes on. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. God created Satan good until unrighteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I've cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I've destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. See the pride? You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. You corrupted yourself and mutated yourself because of your pride and self-love and your failure to love and acknowledge God as the giver of your gifts. I cast you to the ground. There's quite a bit of detail in Scripture about what went on in the heavenly realm if we look at it that way. Jesus says, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He's cast to the ground. His sin brings immediate justice from God, and the innocent angels see God's justice. Can you imagine being in the innocent angel angelic realm, and you know your population is being subjected to this temptation, and you see your friends and relatives and loved ones and your neighbors in this population you exist in falling over after this cherub this Lucifer, and you, you, you're saying, why are you going there? God is the one who made us. God is the one who provides for us and sustains us in love. Why are you going with him? He's a creature like you. You could almost see a debate going on. And two-thirds of the angels remain loyal to God, and a third don't. They prove their disloyalty in going after the latest fad and the, and the most sparkly thing that they see at the moment in this momentary fascination with the the usurper's beauty, this division happens in heaven. Just like humanity is divided into two groups, they stumble over the, the cornerstone. We don't divide humanity by ethnicity or any other means. We divide humanity by those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. Two groups of humanity, just two. Two groups of angels, those who follow Satan and those who are loyal to God. God's justice comes They'd never seen evil. They'd never seen temptation. And now they're witnessing it. They see the fruits of it, the awful fruits of it, are when God judges the angelic realm and He casts a third of them out of the beauty of the realm He created for them. Those souls, if you will, those angelic souls are lost permanently. And I mentioned this in the first class in the overview, but I don't know if you can imagine a third of the world's population dying all of a sudden 
how that would affect you. If, if even just a third of the people you knew in your sphere of life, let's say you know several hundred or several thousand people in your life over the span of your life, if a third of them died all of a sudden, that would be a devastating blow, a devastating blow to see the beauty of heaven and all the perfections of all the order that was there, all the activity that went on, all the styles of worship and all the things that happened, ripped out, thrown down, and lost the shocking drama of it, the contrast between good and evil, the emergence of God's justice, His love for purity, His intolerance for anything impure, His unwillingness to share His rightful glory with another, His immediate justice, His pronouncement of judgment, and the consequences of that sin are absolutely cosmically shockwaves in their uh, experience of existence. This is... Absolutely. We're going to get into that. And there are changes with them too, we believe. So God didn't spare those angels when they sinned. He cast them into hell and committed them into pits of darkness reserved for judgment. They're lost. And this is where we are in our chart now. The influence of Satan in the innocent angelic realm has brought about a great fall, and a third of the population of angels is now changed. They've lost the God who, who sustained them. Right? All the good things that they derived from abiding in relational communion with God have now been lost and ripped away. They're now independent from God and they're left to themselves. They still have some echoes of the original creation in them. They still have intelligence. They know what's happening to them. They still have a moral consciousness. They know they're guilty. They know God's judgments are right. And they know it's too late. They're aware. They're aware of God's glory, too. Do you believe that it's possible for the fallen angels of heaven, however, myriads upon myriads, ten thousands upon ten thousands, many, 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 a whole giant third of that giant group, do you think it's possible that they now are displaying God's glory in a unique way that had never before been seen? I hate to use the word expendable, but I will say that God is producing a greater good from the great evil that they tried to perpetrate. And yes, they do glorify God in a unique way. And things about God are being seen in a created order that had never been seen before and could never have been seen in another way. So if you want to study the fallen angels, how is it that God uses them to glorify himself? That's a, 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 a sobering thing to study. And there are a lot of scriptures that talk about that. Well, we, we saw one of them. He cast them and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for permanent judgment, right? There's another one. Angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he's kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. There still remains a future judgment for them. There's an initial judgment, but yet there's a judgment to come. Is a now, not yet. The initial and more to come in the final judgment. And we'll see that when we get to this, this point on our chart, if I can get there. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. The final judgment comes at the end, in the eschaton, before all things are, are con at the consummation, are wrapped up in Christ and resolved, and all the books are balanced, and all the judgment happens. Humanity and fallen angels will be fully and finally judged at that point in the future. But right now, what I would like to talk about is the two-thirds of the angels, and you mentioned this, Mike, that remained loyal to God. Did they remain loyal to God because they had some special insight, special knowledge? No, we're going to say, look, it's the same as us. We don't say, I got saved because I was smart enough to figure out the gospel. I wanted that life insurance policy. I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to look out for my best interest, and my best long-term interest is to be in heaven instead of hell. So I'm going to choose Jesus based on my real super smart chooser, and I'm going to determine my destiny with a little flip of my little mental switch. We don't say that. We say God has to open the eyes of the blind. The self-serving, self-deifying, corrupted sinner has to say, I'm offensive to God. God is holy. I'm not. I need rescue. You cry out to God. When God opens the scales off your eyes and he, he gives you a new heart and He regenerates you, He gives you faith to believe in Christ. He gives you the eyes to see your sin, conviction of sin, confession of sin repentance. I want to get away from that. It's sucking me into hell. 
where do I turn? I want to turn from this, but I have to turn to something. And so I repent of this. I turn in faith toward Christ. I see Christ for who He is, the divine Savior who alone can rescue me, who alone can satisfy the demands of God's justice, who alone can take away my sin and give me His own righteousness. And see, the gospel is a divine miracle. We don't say, I figured it out. What do you have that you've not received? It's the same thing in the angelic realm. Do you think that these elect angels are sitting around heaven going, boy, am I glad I'm, I chose right? I could have chose Lucifer. You know, he was pretty, pretty shiny. But I made the right choice. Do you think they're sitting around congratulating themselves, pridefully saying, I did it? No, they're saying, thank you, Lord, for preserving us in the right calibration toward you, for granting us the, the, the loyalty to escape that powerful temptation. It had to have been powerful. These angels were accustomed to beauty. They wouldn't have been easily fooled by some grotesque blackness. You know, most of Satan's deceptions are just a little bit of error mixed in with a whole lot of truth. It all looks real good, but there's a little twist. There's a little condition. There's something not right about it. It's not God-centered. It's something other-centered. Anything not God-centered is perversion. Even if you take the good things that God made, if you worship the creation instead of the creator, boy, did you miss the mark. I don't care how close you are to the bullseye. If you're off the side of that bullseye, you're not in it. And I, I guarantee you those angels in heaven are grateful to God for His mercy to them, His, His gracious preservation of their state of innocence. They didn't fall into sin. They didn't need a Redeemer. Okay? They're different from us in that sense, but they're like us in the sense that they've received a gift from God that wasn't of themselves. Okay? And now they're locked in a perpetual state of permanent holiness. They're now given the gift of impeccability, which means they cannot any longer be tempted. They cannot any longer sin. They're not in any risk of falling. They're now given a state of perpetual assurance of, of permanent relation with God. Like we talk about assurance of salvation. We talk about how, how great it's going to be when we're finally there and there's never any more doubt. They don't have any doubt about their permanent estate of blissful union with God. They've received gifts that they couldn't have appreciated fully in this, their state of innocence. That's why God didn't intend to leave them in a state of innocence. You imagine the intensity of the deepening appreciation for the person of God, His purity, His holiness, and His absolute hatred of everything else. Now they no longer just love what God loves, they hate what God hates. They saw what that did to their relatives and their friends and their neighbors and the destruction and the separation from God and the utter hopelessness of it. Death. That's death. Spiritual death. They saw that and they saw it as a consequence of defying God's perfections and defying what's true and what's right. And they saw the beauty of it. And now, what kind of a spiritual condition are they in as a, compared to where they were in innocence? They've grown in their understanding of God. They've grown in their appreciation for God. They've grown in their worship of God. You can only worship God insofar as you know Him accurately. Right? Absolutely, Mike. How can you thank him enough? I wish that was on the tape here because that's very edifying stuff. I appreciate you saying that. Jesus says, he who's been forgiven much loves much. Right? We appreciate it so much. The contrast. You see, we learn and understand what's not yet known by contrast and comparison with what's already known. And God is showing you a bigger thing yet to be known as you extrapolate forward toward what you want to yet know. And so the contrast of good and evil shines the light, that black backdrop 
shines a light of God's goodness in a way that was never before seen. And so really, that's what we're trying to get at in this class, and I'm going to have to wrap up within the next few minutes. I try not to go past 745, but just a glimmer into God's great purposes in the angelic history as it unfolds. This is unfolding before human, humanity is even created, so God has not made man the center of the universe, has he? All this is going on before we even exist. It's not all about us. It can't be, right? God is revealing himself in concentric waves of unfolding history in the innocent angelic realm, in the fall of the fallen angels, in the elect angels, and into perpetuity. None of these lessons will be ever lost. God doesn't waste a thing. Nothing he ever does will be forgotten. I think of heaven like the greatest theological library that could possibly exist because every bit of history of God's revelation Benevolent self-revelation that he's giving to his creatures is there recorded for us to, to, to contemplate and to think about and access. You could pull one of those books off that seminary shelf and see, what did God do here? But you know, you're probably going to pull those books off in the form of people and angels and say, what was it like when Satan was tempting you? Did you feel the temptation? Were you drawn that direction? How is it that you stayed loyal to God? How is it that God preserved you and the elect angels in this way? And how did you become aware that he was giving you this, this freedom from temptation and this impeccability and this security? And how is it your discovery of God's goodness exploded your mind into unbelievable, unfathomable worship toward God? Wouldn't you want to interview an angel? I think you might be able to. I think they're going to want to interview you as well. Absolutely right. And we, we, we mentioned that once in the overview class, too, and I want to get into that a little bit more. But when we get to this larger stage of unfolding history and we ask the question, why are angels so absorbed with watching what goes on in the church and so absorbed with God's purposes for his work? And because they want to see what God's going to do next, what he's going to reveal about himself next. They want that discovery. They have an appetite for it. What will you show us about yourself next, Lord? That's what gets them up in the morning. They don't have to sleep, but, you know, that's what motivates them. So this, this chart is just one way to kind of have a framework for looking at the way God has unfolded himself throughout redemptive history. But redemptive history is not just about man and his redemption. It's about the revelation of God's person. And, it, and, and angels aren't, aren't redeemed in the sense that we are, but they're recipients of God's giving of himself. And, you know, we're going to ask that question that Edwards asked at the beginning of the class, for what purpose has God created the world? Or wh why has he created anything outside of himself? If he needs nothing and he's totally content in himself and the intertrinitarian love, there's no loneliness there, there's just perfection and mutual affection and mutual love and respect and adoration and mutual worship, and yes, it's right for God to, to worship his own perfections. It's not like a selfish man who elevates himself. It's different. God is the only being in existence who would have the right and be doing right to worship himself. And in the perfection of that everlasting eternal bliss, you just say, why does God create anything? When I look out at the creation, I'm like, how did this all come to existence? None of this is an accident. There's got to be a purpose. So we're asking that question, for what purpose did God create all this? And we're only answering it at the tip of the iceberg. And toward the end of the class, I want to try to answer it as best I can, but it's a process. And that process is not going to be complete until we're all in glory, right? But shouldn't we aspire to, um, we can't comprehend God, but we can apprehend God to the extent that he has revealed himself. And shouldn't that be our appetite? Like the angels who long to see, how are you revealing yourself? Shouldn't that be our motive too? How can we know how God has revealed himself? There's so much we have missed by just not paying attention, not reading church history and seeing all that he's done. You know, Acts 28 doesn't end at Acts 28. It keeps right on going through church history. So where's our appetite to know God? And how can we know God? Through the means through which he's revealed himself in history, through providence. And it, it's, oh, it's nothing more worth paying attention to.
and I didn't get through all my notes, and I'm okay with that because some really good interactions, and um, the beautiful thing about a class is it's kind of open-ended. I mean, it's not like a sermon where you got to start and you got to stop, and that's it, my, my only chance. We try to come back next week and take up some of these questions, and what we'll be looking at is humanity in a state of innocence, and then the fall. And there are some distinctions, and not just one-for-one one parallels. There are some differences. There's some unique components to the way God's going to reveal himself, and we don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss this overarching theme. So, any more comments? Yes. Yep. That's a very good question. It's a good question. I can't answer it entirely, but I can try to give you just a brief answer. Maybe I'll have some time to think about it this week and come back with a better answer next week. But I would say that just the fact that he's attempting these things means that he's insane enough to think he can pull it off. He's made himself mad. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, de the demons know Jesus. You know, have you come to, uh, you know, judge us before our time? And, you know, they know him. So what we'll see as we go through, and we're not done talking about fallen angels because the influence of fallen angels permeates through human history. So the initial judgment of, of the demons, if you will, the fallen angels, is not the permanent judgment. They're cast down, but they're not yet locked into the final judgment of hell. And so there's sort of at least some po portion of their population is running rampant and free reign in the world. I, I think they're inhabiting most of the high places in government today from, from <laughs> the way people are acting. But yeah, the demonic influence in the world continues on. And so their knowledge of what's going on and their attempts to circumvent God's will is completely insane. And they're going to be frustrated at every effort because everything they do to try to undermine God or usurp God ends up fulfilling his own purposes. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing about God's sovereignty is that he turns these evils into greater goods. So we're going to be looking at that as we go through the human part of it. Uh, what is the interaction between the angelic realm and humans a little bit too? So good questions. I'll try to think about that this week and see if we can integrate some of that into, into our, as we go on in the presentation. Okay, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the uh, mental fortitude to um, sit this long in a class. We have to acknowledge that uh, the subject matter is certainly worthy, and so we pray that you'd undergird us to continue thinking about these things during the week. Help us to grow in our understanding and appreciation for you. Help us to be humbled by who we are in light of who you are. And help us to be grateful for the fact that you would so condescend and love us that you'd integrate us into your plan to reveal yourself, to knit us to your son. And we're so grateful to be united to him and to have him as our exemplar, as our savior, and as our God. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.